Yes. I think I can. Do you want me to record? I think I might be recording. Yes, I am recording. Great. Just give me one more second. Okay, I think I'm ready to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our um, public pre-K technical assistance uh, session. Today's session, we're gonna be talking a lot about child development services, working relationships with them, um, screening, et cetera. So my name is Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist at the Department of Education on the early learning team. Um, and I'm joined by some colleagues. I'm gonna hand it over to Marcy to introduce herself and the rest of the team. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. I'm Marcy Whitcomb. I'm the public pre-K consultant on the early learning team. And I will let Sue introduce herself. Hi, I'm Sue Gallant. I'm the pre-K expansion consultant on the early learning team. And we want to have our guests from CDS introduce themselves. I'll hand over to Lori to introduce herself. Sure. Hi, I'm Lori Whittemore. I'm the Director of Preschool Program Development for CDS, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Roberta Lucas. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Roberta Lucas, and I am the Child Development Services State Director, all things birth to five. I also will introduce the rest of our team. You can see on the photos. Um, Leanne Larson is the director, our director of our early learning team. Stacy McCoy is our Head Start Collaboration Director, and Jane Kersling is our Pre-K Grant co uh, Coordinator. Okay. Oh, I didn't have that one up. Sorry. <laughs> I have two screens going. It's very confusing. Sometimes it does it. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay, we're good. So today we are here to talk, as Nicole had said, about relationships with CDF, coordination between programs, and we'll check a little bit in on screening as well. So we'll start off with talking about some recent legislative information that came through last year. Um, it was LD386, which was a resolve directing the Department of Education to establish the process for transitioning the provision of early childhood special education services for children with disabilities from four years of age to, six, to under six years from the Regional Child Development Services System to the school administrative units. What's important to know about that right now is that there are no changes to the current process for identifying and serving children three to five year old with identified special education needs. So those services and those provisions of services are still, and um, until anything changes, will remain with regional uh, child development service system. Services for four-year-olds is part B, 619. It's currently under the provision of CDS, the child development services. Referrals are made to CDS by any adult interacting with a child who presents with developmental concerns. And when those referrals are, ma are made, um, <clears throat> they uh, go on further evaluation by a licensed specialist on the IEP team that will determine, um, an IEP team that will be developed and reports that will be discussed. Another thing we wanted to touch on just real quick are services for five-year-olds who are in pre-K and chapter 676. Um, if a child is kindergarten age eligible, but receives their education in the pre-K classroom, special, the special education responsibilities do fall to the SAU if they are five years old and kindergarten eligible. A child may qualify for continued services through CDS if they turn five between July 1st and October 15th of that school year and have had an IEP in place prior to December 1st of the previous year. It's also important to understand that a 676 determinations, they're made by the IEP team and require parental agreements. Some additional resources that we have for you. Oops. Additional resources would be, um, the first one is the CDS um, website. So that will be there. I think um, maybe Sue will throw that in the chat for us. 
Chapter 101 is Maine Unified Special Education Regulation or MUSER, which outlines everything uh, special education related. And then CDS state level contacts, um, Dr. Roberta Lucas, who's here with us today. She's our Part 619, our Part B 619 coordinator. Jackie Hersom is the assistant Part B 619 coordinator and their email addresses are on the screen. And then Lori who introduced herself also um, will be another contact for you. Um, I also wanna say at this time, if there are any questions while we're going through the slides and giving information, please feel free to, feel free to throw them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, we do have Dr. Lucas and uh, Lori here today um, to help us answer any questions that are more specific to the CDS. So moving on to CDS recommended coordination. Um, reaching out and getting to know your local director and IEP facilitators that are staffed there is really important. And one way of doing that is to find your regional coverage site. This is another um, website address that will appear in the chat room for you, but that will bring you to a list of all of the regional CDS sites um, and towns they cover. It's important to set up regular meetings, whether they're in person or virtual with your CDS site and their staff. Helping each other document and process data and timeliness for referrals and meetings is another key point. Um, it's also really important to focus on building relationships and communication strategies among CDS and your SAU special education team. And I would also include your classroom teachers in that. Um, that just helps keep lines of communication open uh, processes that may be unclear um, can be cleared up with questions and conversations and building those relationships. And then also to assure that there is an annual MOU in place. We are going to talk about MOUs a little bit later down the road and what that specifically means. Um, <clears throat> but it's really important that everybody comes to the table and uh, the annual the MOU is um, updated annually. It's also important to know that Head Start has a statewide MOU that's already in place for those oper operating in a partnership. And because of that, if you are an SAU that is collaborating with Head Start classrooms, you do not need a separate MOU for those collaborative classrooms. So if you have classrooms that are in Head Start collaboration, that's covered. If you have classrooms also that are not in a collaboration with Head Start, your district will still need to have an annual MOU in place, a separate one. And then have clear timelines time set for referrals to be made with your CDS partners. And then when it comes to unmet needs, um, some things to consider um, in the event that CDS is unable to staff or provide the IEP and documented, the services documented in the IEP, um, something to consider would be, is the, does the SAU have a licensed staff who could be contracted providers for CDS? Contracting is another thing we're gonna talk about just down the road a little bit, but it's something to consider there. Um, and also, is there a plan in place that all parties are aware of if this does happen? Um, and one thing to look at would be virtual therapies that might be an option for children and how to support that. The next thing we're going to look at are kindergarten transition meetings, which happen in collaboration with CDS and the school district and the families. So these meetings are scheduled from April 1st through June 15th of the school year. So this time of the year um, before the children go into kindergarten. Responsibilities for CDS would include working with the family to schedule the day, time and place for those meetings completing an annual IEP prior to the meeting, if that's necessary, depending on when the IEP um, needs to be completed annually, date-wise, and then informing all parties of the day, time, and place of that meeting. The district, district responsibilities include having attendees at the meeting, which include administrators, teachers, providers, and others who work closely with the child to attend that meeting. The district will be responsible for taking the minutes of the meeting, and they'll also be responsible for amending the IEP when the child is enrolled in kindergarten and then making their offer of fee. And the family responsibilities include expressing their concerns for their child and advocating for their child and services, and then enrolling their child into the kindergarten program for the school. 
All right. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the MOU and contracts and how these are different. So every district that has public pre-K, so long if they have classrooms that are not in a Head Start collaboration, need to need to develop an MOU with their local CDS office. This is required by chapter 124. It is something that needs to be initiated by the school administrative unit and it needs to be renewed annually. And basically this is an agreement between the local CDS office and the district outlining the responsibilities and the working relationship between your two agencies. These are signed by the superintendent, also by the local CDS site director and also by Dr. Lucas. So that everybody's aware of what's going on. Now, a contract is a bit different. If your district is able to provide services for students in your public pre-K program as a contracted provider for CDS, and there are a number of ways this can work, the contract is needed only if you're going to provide services for your four-year-olds. It doesn't negate the need for an MOU. It, you need to have both in place. And we really worked this year to streamline that process. And that's why Lori's here. Lori is the go-to if your SAU is interested in providing services as a contracted provider. And this can be either itinerant SDI, where you might have a special ed teacher who can serve those kiddos, OT, PT, speech, or it could be a special purpose classroom. I really want to advocate for as much as we can having our public pre-K kiddos educated in their homeschool with their typically developing peers. Um, it's a very a piece I'm very passionate about and really can speak to the benefits of that for kiddos um, when they can learn from their typically developing peers. So if your district is interested, please reach out to Lori and her contact info is here. And Marcy, can you pop that one in the chat for them? And yes, she will guide you through that process. Lori, do you wanna to speak to that at all and give any further explanation to what I've given? I think you really covered it, Sue. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'd be excited to work with any district who wants to either expand their current services they provide or they want to start uh, providing services to children with disabilities in their district. And this is really a way to help with unmet need. We all are facing the staffing shortages, be it our local special ed departments and our SAUs and CDS is facing the same challenge. With CDS providers, they have to travel between different school sy systems and sites to provide for children where if you have staff on site, it really can meet those needs. And I really encourage you to consider it. If you'd like to talk to someone who's been there, you can reach out to me. Um, our, the district that I'm coming from has done this for several years and I stepped in as an inclusive and I was the special ed teacher for that. And Lori and I are both willing to talk to you further about that. Our next slide. talks about pre-K screening. So first off, this is required for all incoming four-year-olds coming into your public pre-K program. A part of the reason we're doing this is to meet the child find requirements, just as, as the same requirements that you have with kindergarten children and, and children who transfer into your district. It assists in preparing the school to meet students where they are. It helps them get to know their families and prepare for entrance into the classroom. And districts do this either in the spring or the fall prior to pre-K starting. Chapter 124 does require that this happen within the first 30 days of school if you're waiting until the fall. A positive thing that comes out of this is that screening is not then required for those pre-K students going into kindergarten. If they've been screened in pre-K, your district does not have to screen them again to go into kindergarten. Some districts choose to do that, but it is not required. And screening is also not required for incoming students who already have an IEP in place because they've already been identified. Um, you must use research-based developmental tools. Some examples are the DIAL, um, the DIAL-4, the Brigantz, the BDI, and the ASQ and ASQSE. And those are all great tools to use for screening. If you have questions about screening tools, don't hesitate to reach out um, to either CDS, I'm sure, could make recommendations, as can Marcy and I and other members of the early learning team. Data from screening really informs classroom planning, helps you to create balanced classrooms um, when you have in a situation where there are multiple classrooms. 
screening results should be shared with families in a family accessible way, in a way that really makes sense to them without jargon and that's easily understood. And you also will want to share that information with CVS if a referral is made. It can help them to see those scores. So speaking of referrals, let's talk a little bit about that process. We all know that we've seen increasingly challenging kiddos come into our classrooms over the past couple of years. COVID has not had a positive effect on our little people who have been at home. And many of them are really struggling when they come into a structured setting for the first time. And we wanna be sure that we're giving them an opportunity to settle into their pre-K classroom and get used to the process before we immediately make a referral. Sometimes it's just a lack of exposure to a program and and a lack of understanding of how to navigate a classroom setting. So we really want to work when children have concerns that, that may indicate a possible disability, we should really first start with that multi-tiered system of support process, including collecting some baseline da data. So you know how often things are going on at the start, collaborating with the family who knows this kiddo far better than we do when they first enter, as well as district support personnel to develop interventions that might help the kiddo be successful. Again, we're always here to help with suggestions. And also there should be ongoing progress monitoring that keeps track of, of how the interventions are working, just as we do with our K-12 students. And again, giving time for our kiddos to adjust to the classroom and access their learning in the least restrictive environment. If those concerns persist, despite interventions, and you really have concerns beyond that point that there's a, a possibility for a disability, then a referral should be made to CDS. And you have a couple options for making referrals. There is an online form that you can access. And if Marcy can pop that one in the chat for me, um, you can complete the referral form on the website. I know for teachers who don't often have time during the school day for lengthy phone calls, that can be a good option. But you can also call your local CDS office and talk with someone right there. And I also find that's sometimes great to do, even if you submit the referral online, a quick call to let your local office know that you've made a referral so that they have that connection between that referral and your program. And please know CDS has 15 days to respond to the referral by setting up an intake meeting. And they'll be talking with families and making decisions about how to proceed at that meeting. So there's some steps to go through, just like anywhere in, in public, any public school opportunity. We're back to our kiddos again. Marcy, do you want to take this slide or do you want me to continue? Um, sure, you can continue. You're okay. doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. So really, our goal is meaningful classroom inclusion. And a quote that I really like that is included here is that teachers learn from other teachers and children learn from other children. And providing the opportunity, implementing universal design for learning opportunities that meet the needs of all learners in our classroom really benefits everyone. I also like that saying, together everyone achieves more. And I think we need to remember that as we work with our kiddos. All right. And then I think we are on to questions. I just want to open the floor to Lori and um, Dr. Lucas, and if there's anything that you would like to add that might be helpful to our districts um, in working through these processes, and now would be a great time to do that, and we can open the floor for questions at the same time. I don't have anything specific to add. Um, I think you did a great job uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon, so, um, but if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Lori, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, I would just say that one of the first questions when I meet with the district is um, how will the costs be covered? And so I just wanna just reinforce that um, CDS will cover all costs associated with special education for any children that you're providing services for as a public school, including paying salary and benefits for staff that you hire. So we really wanna ensure that you're not incurring any costs for the children that we're responsible for. Great, thank you. I know we do have a very small audience, but Cheryl, I was just wondering if you had any questions. 
I, I do not. I was um, wanting to listen in here at the updates with um, CDS and hear about your collaboration efforts, um, being in community collaboratives that are focusing on early childhood over the next year, just trying to be a little more knowledgeable to be a, a, a resource to those teams. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. Maybe.